first of all, double platinum. Oh, sorry. School again, Derby. School again. <laughs> um, you know what? I, I've been saying this for years now. When I was uh, a child still living at home with my parents, I was a figure skater. And um, we would go to competitions and they'd throw in their eight track, the Neil Diamond tape. And we listened to that rotate for two, two and three hour drives there and back. And that made them happy. They loved it. Um, it might have been the fact that that was the only eight track they have. I don't know, but we did listen to it a whole lot. Um, every generation deserves to have their own identity. My mm -hmm. kids don't need to find Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd um, the staple of their musical taste. It would be unfair for me to expect that of them. I would really appreciate it if they went there and and loved it and got out of it what I and probably we got out of that era. Um, I would hate if that when I get older, all I had to listen to was Neil Diamond because that's what my parents listened to. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad they had that through their years to keep them where their mind wanted to go, I guess. So I don't know, you know, I work, I, I, in my workouts, I listen to some stuff that's a little unorthodox for a rocker, but I, in my heart of hearts, having come from, a, um, I've done country, I've done R and B. I was with a seven police, piece African-American band from Harlem, New York for only a tiny, tiny little while. But I auditioned with like 50 people. I got the gig and then I left them. Sorry, sorry, but um, to join Steelback because I wanted to sing rock and roll and not Donna Summers you can, and Anita Ward. But I, I appreciate a uh, good melody and a good groove. To yeah. me, groove is everything. So there are tunes out there. I had my one of my sons introduce me to Nicki Minaj, her first two albums. There was some, if not good grooves on there, there were some lyrics on there that spoke. They were rap, and I'm not a fan of rap, but it opened my eyes and my ears to a, a, a type of lyric that spoke to a whole community that I, but it spoke to me as well. The, the, the language wasn't mine, but it was a language and it, yep. it was true to the core of what her message was. And it wasn't all just fuck this, fuck that. Like a lot of the stuff is kill this. It, it was real. And so being open to new experiences is a wonderful thing. Being stuck in your rut, as long as it makes you happy is a good thing, you know? I don't want to judge anymore, right? I just want to. I just want to move forward. So yes to your comment. There are there are artists out there that are like, <laughs> okay, but if somebody's loving them, you know that's their jam. Have fun. <laughs> I want to say thank you for that answer because just as you were, uh, uh, Dave, perspective. I I that's an area of my life I've always struggled with. I like what I like. I don't like what I don't like. To the point where um, you know, raised Catholic, so I can dig in like nobody's business, and uh, yeah, you opened my mind, Darby Mills, to maybe give some stuff a chance that I might not have uh, in the past. That was a great answer. Thanks so much for that. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it just yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever the motivation is. I mean, I'm, I have four daughters. You know, and and they would say, Dad, you got to hear this. It's like, oh, yeah, but if it's not, you know, if it's not Rush and if it's not the Beatles and if it's not, yeah. you know, I don't really want to hear yeah. it. But then yeah. it's like, oh, but I would look, try to open my mind for it. I was like, oh, and I, to your point, the lyrics are poignant and the groove is kind of cool. Now, I don't believe it's a, you know, a four or five or six piece band doing it. I think it's probably yeah. being created on a computer. But yeah. you know, and we're learning more about that, Sean and I. We've, we've actually had a couple of these up and coming hip hop stars that we don't know much about. But you know what? we got to be open and experience every genre if we really want to represent a music on this show. So it's kind of cool to be open towards new things and all. And country is another thing. I never, like, I was never a country <laughs> fan. 
But you know what? There's some good players and there's some awesome lyrics, some positive messages out there. Yeah. You know? Country is not country. I'm sorry. I'm going to get crucified for this. Country is not country. Country is pop rock from the 80s. Yes. That's what country is now. So there's no sense hating it because it's just got more heartfelt lyrics. It's not all about getting laid and drinking. Now mm -hmm. there's a story to the song, but the melodies. <laughs> and, and here's and how I met her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's like yeah. the foreplay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And here's another story about just being open minded. Um, uh, years ago, uh, my oldest son, who, who um, has got the loudest voice I've ever heard, it's too bad he's not a singer. Uh, he can do share really well, um, but didn't become a singer, but he's got an ear and he can, he can pick music. And this was one experience of him picking music. He was playing stuff in his bedroom one day and uh, I'm like, what? song is that that's that's kind of rude and i don't think people on the radio are going to appreciate that advertisers aren't going to appreciate a radio station listening to that music or that song and he's like no it's really good mom oh anyway it turned out to be katy perry and i kissed a girl which ended up being one of my favorite songs yeah. of that era but um to get to the story i meant to tell you about is um he pulled me aside one day he was 13 and he said mom um, you've played a club in Kelowna called Splashes. And I'm like, yes, yeah, many times. I know the manager. He said, perfect. I would really like to go see this female singer from the States there. She's going to be there in two weeks. I'm like, I can't get you in. It's a bar. He says, yeah, but you got, you know, the manager. I said, Clay, I cannot, I can't do that. Don't you're 13. Maybe if you were 18, but not 13. He's like, you know, damn. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, six months later, Lady Gaga breaks with her first tune. And I'm like, that's kind of cool. It's different, kind of cool, liking it. Fell in love with Lady Gaga because my kid was playing it 24-7 in his room, blaring it. Once you hear a song 10 times, you inevitably yep. will like it. Yep. Uh, fell in love with the woman, fought with many rockers over Lady Gaga. And uh, like three years later, he goes, now don't you wish you'd have got me into splashes? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, it was Lady Gaga. I'm like, no freaking way. I'd have been, I'd have had you there in a heartbeat had I known. Your kid so, should be an agent. He should be an agent if he picks up on that right away. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and he's who introduced me to Nikki as well. So his tastes are not classic rock, even though he's going there as he gets older. He's starting to understand the um, the ability of so many musicians to bring something together. That is what is different, and perhaps some would say missing in music today is it's one mastermind throwing a voice in. Well, that's what the old record companies used to do by hiring the um, the wrecking crew. You know, let's face yep. it, they're not doing anything different that, than the industry has done all the way along. Yep. Most of us were just too ignorant to understand that that's what was going on. And so it's like, okay, it's, it's the same the thing, same only thing. different. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. There's, um, there's a friend of ours out here who, uh, he was a rock guy that he's in Nashville now, and he's part of that writing group. Um, and it's funny that you mentioned with the country, because he's a rock guy. Um, and he, he, I talked to him a few years back. His name's Gordy Sampson. He wrote a song for Carrie Underwood. And, um, anyway, his, his theory is that country still was holding on to that whole, um, you know, George Jones and stuff. And then Mutt Lang got involved and all of a sudden country became Mutt Lang's business. Mm -hmm. Away they went. And now what you have is kind of the trails of Mutt Lang. Yeah. Well, and they're still, um, I don't know, what is the biggest music genre out there today? A country is far surpassed anything that I've been involved in. Could you believe that that, that was gonna happen? I'm, no. I don't know, I was surprised disco came back for a while, but it did. So I'm, when I went to LA to do that solo project, actually over in, in England, um, Jody Watley had just come out and the label's going, hey, Here's Jody Watley. She's what's happening. Go do, go do that. So actually, my English stuff was very R and B based, and and uh, you know, I'm almost glad it didn't come out now because it would have been so like what? 
<laughs> so they, some wonderful players. At least they got the experience to spend some time with them, and you know. So in, in time the talk, them. go ahead, Sean. No, I was going to say in the documentary there was a, a piece in there you were talking about. You're going to uh, remaster that that album. Um, did uh, so? Did that ever happen? And do you have plans to get that out? Because um, I think you know what the way that. Um, you know, the genre. And when I say our genre, I mean, Dave and I are eighties babies. I mean, we grew up, you know, eighties, as far as I'm concerned, the grunge thing for me, whatever, there's some stuff I like, but I'm a hair metal guy, you know, Sirius XM channel 39. That's all I listen to. Um, now might be the time for that album to, to rear its head. And, and, you know, so do you have any plans to, to, to kick that out? That's the English stuff you mean? Well, just, yeah, just because in 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 the in your documentary you're talking about you were possibly going to remaster that and, and do something with it. Uh, was I? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <geez. laughs> you know what? I think some of it might be. That the was the drinking I, I days. Watch. I forgot. Yeah. I don't know. Cheers, cheers, guys. Cheers. Mm. I think it. I think it might be that. Um, we would have had to try to get through to MCA, uh, get over to get the masters. The only copy I brought home with me was on what was supposed to be, according to Greg Walsh, the new format, which was an F1. I don't know if you remember hearing about that format, but it did not become the new format. CDs did. Or pardon me. Uh, uh, M, uh, what was the next format? Like a laser disc would have been, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, um, it was three letters. Um, anyway, that format's not around anymore either. So, uh, yeah. no, not gonna do it. It's it's. Uh, <laughs> All your masters are on a Betamax, eh? It's on a Betamax tape, right? So you gotta find a yeah, Betamax well, player. <laughs> exactly, and and uh, I don't even know if the studio where well, Eel Pie's been sold, so I'm pretty sure those the tapes that I did there are gone. I also recorded. Uh, at a, a studio called Ridge Farm, and, uh, and it was fabulous as well. But I don't think, I don't know if that studio still exists, and I'm pretty sure 30 some odd, 35, 36, 37 years later, they would still have the masters. And, and uh, yeah, no, I would go in and record that selection of songs again. Um, meh, no. Fair enough. So, so Darby, here's a question for you, and I'm just thinking back, as it's, it's, you span so many, decades like four decades of distinct music really i mean really different but it's kind of like sean and i like we, we talk about you know the rock that we liked kind of did die you know in 1991 with the release of nirvana you know, like it, it kind of you could see you know the thing yeah. as the roses was still trying to keep it together but it was still it was changing it was evolving and it had to change because there's a lot of shit coming up too i mean from la there's just you know, it's like, uh, is that a guy or I don't even know if it's a guy or a girl anymore. Let's just put the music on and say, oh, I don't even like it. You know, it's just the same crap. So it almost had to die. So you would have experienced that whole grunge scene. But, you know, Sean and I were talking about this today. Like, it should have been you, maybe, and no offense to Alana Miles or Alanis Morissette, but I mean, you're a Canadian superstar, like a Canadian superstar. It's like, what happened? Like, I don't understand why it wasn't you because you had the voice. Um, well, because I was no longer in the headpins and my American deal didn't come through. And when I got back home, I did, it took me five more years when I got the, I got the deal with, um, Warner Music here in Canada. And that's when I released, uh, Never Look Back. Right. <laughs> Poignantly phrased or <laughs> titled. And I, I, I did it another 30 years that that lasted a year on that label and then they wanted to pr promote this young male band with a gorgeous hair down a year blonde front man um and and I lost I lost my deal with them and at that point I just was like you know what I'm I'm good uh, how many people get a chance to get turfed from a band that's that was at the top at least here in Canada um and the deal with the headpins in the states, turn it loud, was signed by uh, Rinaldi in New York. Uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of that label. Oh man, it's been so long. But we went down and did our first tour down there, and um, the uh, turn it loud wasn't in the stores. 
the, the record the label had dropped the ball nobody could buy it you know we just it just didn't work for us and it should have because it was groundbreaking for the time oh my god and um yeah so so we got off that label and that's when we got signed in la and um and then what happened some like i said earlier the head pins have been cursed um from the inception it came it was created via the death of Shelley Siegel, who was the president, I believe was his title, of Mushroom Records, where Chilliwack was signed to, where he one night, uh, I believe of partying, I could be wrong, pardon me if I am, uh, Shelley didn't make it through the night, and all of a sudden Mushroom Records was defunct. It was done. Chilliwack got signed to Solid Gold, uh, while they were getting going through all that uh, contract uh, negotiation and stuff, Brian and Ab formed a band called The Headpins and went into the clubs just to keep their chops up. Uh, like Brian was a driven soul, and so he was he was on it. Um, the, the I think they they finished that album and put it out under Chilliwack but in the meantime they had hired me we did Don't Make It Feel Like Dancing and a couple other songs sent that to Solid Gold Solid Gold signed us with the exception that because they'd already saw so signed Brian and Ab to Chilliwack all they could do was sign me so I was the lone artist signed to the Turn It Loud deal so no pressure, but I mean, at the time I'm like, Woo that's great, right? But it, it, whatever. So well, when um, things went so that you're the one that got fucked that way too. Then that makes sense. I get it now. But yeah, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you're the one. Yeah, okay. I get whatever. It. You know, great. This is so great. Really, I I wouldn't I wouldn't change 95 percent of what went down. It's made me who I am today. I'm so grateful to to have my husband. Uh, two beautiful children. Um, I've had a 40 plus year career. Not a lot of artists can say that. And there are people out there still willing to put their, their money on the line to, to, to bring me to a show. So I am just um, pissed that this COVID thing happened this year. <laughs> I was on your website today. I saw tour dates in April. I was like, oh my God, did she play? <laughs> There's more. I was like, oh man. I know, I know, no, it's wishful thinking. I, I printed out that poster and I sleep on it every night. Oh, <laughs> that's sin. Sean and I were talking this morning, Darby, and I don't, I'm not sure, Sean, I don't want to steal your thunder because this was really your point. Because uh, I watched, well, I watched, you know, the uh, the documentary and I, was, and I was thinking after our conversation last night, it's like, she's so talented. She's got such a great voice. It's like, what's next? And, and Sean said, don't you get it, man? She's not giving up. She's like, he watched the video and he totally understood. It's like, she doesn't want to work at Walmart. She, this is her thing. And it's the same common thread that we talk to every friggin' musician on this show. And we've talked to a lot of people and we are musicians ourselves. It's under your skin. You know, you can't get it out of there. You got to do what you got to do. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and unfortunately sometimes you can't, like I was saying, I don't know how long I got I, I've got left this. I do have a, a local band that was uh, a month away from going live. Uh, it's called Press Play, and it's songs that I grew up with. Um, geez, where's the list? Just um, uh, like, uh, how long has this been going on? Uh, yeah. Stuff like that, right? That was the wrong melody. I'm, so, I'm trying to pull it out of my my ear right now but uh just great classes go classics going way way back there's one or two from the 60s um just just wonderful songs that i don't have to do the derby ah! because i don't know how long i've got so i'm trying to like ease myself into a new style of vocals so that i can hopefully go till I'm 80 so that my mortgage is covered at least till I'm 80. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Well, and what, when Dave and I were talking, my, my point too was that um, uh, I, I found it inspirational because you were talking about, you know, I'm going to, you know, now's the time to do this. And it was like, it wasn't um, like, I'm a big Sopranos fan, fan and Tony Soprano has this line, you know, remember when is the lowest form of conversation. You're not remembering when, you're going back out and you're doing it. And I yeah. found that 
whatever's thrown at you, holy shit, if Derby Mills can go out there and friggin' play, then hey, Sean, the guy that's yelling at you right now, you know, pick your lower lip off the ground and get out there and do it. And that was my point with all this. You're just, you're not quitting. You're, you're going to go and give it one more crack and, and, and see where, see where the chips fall. Um, I, I have a girlfriend who, who comes and does my merch for me and, and it takes care of a whole bunch of stuff for me that, that, um, says Darby, when you get up on stage, you, you glow to, to me, to her, Liz is her name. I, I love you, Liz. Um, she, she's, you, you're at home up there. That's where you should be. And I, I know there are nights where I, I, I don't get up on stage and call it in. I don't, you can't sing the way I sing and call that in. You have to be bringing it up from your butt, right? I mean, that's, ah! So, um, but th that kind of describes where I am, even though sometimes I don't realize that she sees it and she picks me up sometimes if we've had a bad show and, and she'll say stuff like that to me. And it's, I'm so grateful that other people can see that in me and, and uh, give me that. I don't know. I was going to say any real artist, that would be unfair. There's a lot of artists out there that really are insecure in their heart of hearts and they really do need that admiration or that that push that's why they became an artist because they get it that push from being an artist right so i am not immune to to needing um uh, a, a push or someone telling me that they they appreciate what i'm attempting to to do so yeah well I'm what i say go ahead I, when i was watching the documentary what i picked up on i mean you, you were sounding amazing um, did I read somewhere that you, uh, you possibly were into Taekwondo? Uh, I took, um, my oldest son was five. My youngest son was six months when we walked into Keys Taekwondo here in Vernon. And my oldest son was 18 when we left. Uh, we all became black belts and above. Awesome. Um, and then I ended up teaching for the better part of nine years. So well, that was the other point I said to Dave, she could kick the shit out of the two of us. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, but I mean, your voice was like, and the question I have for you, you know, you probably played a lot of crappy clubs with a lot of crappy monitors and, um, you know, opening for bands where you didn't get sound checks. And um, when you're up there now, are you a monitor person or are you an in-ears person? Oh, I've been, any years have saved my voice, without a doubt. Um, I started using, we were in White Horse, as a matter of fact, when somebody lent me a pair of in-ears, and I was like, what is this? I don't have to compete with the symbols anymore, and I don't have to compete with... <laughs> uh, yeah, um, that was McLeod and I's biggest... Uh, I threw a tantrum. We were on tour with Eddie Money. Um, that's right after losing the Quiet Riot dates. I don't know if I've mentioned this show. We we had uh, Saga, Headpin Saga, Quiet Riot uh, back in, uh, right in the middle of the Headpin's uh, su success. And we were doing the American, uh, the American tour as a, as a three band. And we were doing 40,000 seat uh, stadiums, um, if I can recall correctly. And uh, we were at the third, if third or fourth show and um dressed ready to go the theater is full or the uh, auditorium uh, coliseum is full and there's the five minute knock on the door and it flies open and joe jackson our road manager says everybody grab your stuff get everything out of here grab the boost and get on the bus it's like what it's like, just shut up get on the fucking bus go 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 it's like what so they go, wah, wah, wah. everybody bitching, yeah. We get on the bus, they open the door, the buses were inside, and out we go. And it's like, okay, what the hell is going on? And he said, two of the guys from Quiet Riot had a fight last night. The band broke up. We're getting the hell out of Dodge. Mm. That was the end of what was supposed to be 30 shows. Oh. What do you think might have happened to us had we had that tour? go down right just just another like what the hell um <laughs> that's what we, so we uh spent a week in florida drank a little bit um 
ended up going over to LA, meeting up with Eddie Money. Um, that's where I had a big fight with McLeod over monitors and uh, <laughs> oh, finished that tour in Portland, I believe, and ended up landing the White Snake tour. And we went and toured with John Lord, Cozy Powell, David Coverdale, John Sykes, Neil Murray, and whoever else was out there. Um, all over Europe to sold out uh, Coliseums. Kiss was pretty cool, but White's, that was, we played the Hammersmith Odeon. Like, come on. Oh. I played the Hammersmith Odeon. <laughs> I'm cool. <laughs> Trust me. So, the sleep with Hammersmith. Oh, yeah. We're talking at a tale. Kiss was notorious for not letting their open bands do sound, sound checks, if, I, if I've been told correctly. Is that, is that accurate? You know what? I cannot. I cannot remember that, but it wasn't even, it wasn't the head pins that did that tour. Brian and Ab were still with Chilliwack. Okay. It was what we called the B team. And um, we, we still did well enough that I remember we were in, I think it was Montreal. And I, we had just seen the guys without their makeup on that night. And um, I remember thinking the guys that I grew up with in high school would just be shitting to know that I was sitting beside Gene Simmons and he didn't have his makeup on, you know, like, yeah, it's so cool. And um, so we were getting up on stage, the lights are out, I'm walking up on stage and I hear, hey, um, what do you listen to? And I'm like, who the hell, what? And I look and it's Gene Simmons, way, I'm like, oh, hey, uh, Marshall Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's, all, it's all that came to mind actually I was thinking how do I throw a twist into this and I threw a twist he just like was like oh and walked away and I'm like okay I'm not sure if that worked or not but it turns out he did remember me because um uh he uh Helix was on tour with them in Europe a couple years later and Gene went up to um Brian Ballmer and says do you uh, you know that uh, head 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 pin band in Canada? Do you know them? And we toured with Elix a whole bunch. And he says, yeah. He says, you that chick singer. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, I left a mark. Perfect. You know. So I'm sorry. I don't even know where we were going, <laughs> but I went there. So yeah. Yeah. Oh no. And I mean, you know, they're 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 one of my hero bands growing up. You know, one one uh, regret I have is. I love Derek Carr. I'm a drummer. I never got to meet the man. And uh, just every, uh, a lot of people told me he was, you know, as nice as he was brilliant. So, I mean, for a memory like that for you, it was great. But, but what I was saying was uh, I was told by a number of people who were on KISS tours that they never let their opening act sound check. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's one band who I won't name, a Canadian band. Toronto, but that I won't name. That uh, on the Lock Up Your Sons tour, once again, Brian was Brian and Ab were not on that. We're not on that tour, right? And uh, so we did the Lock Up Your Sons. That was the longest tour I was ever on. I think it was a month and a half, or right across Canada. Pins did great. Um, uh, newspapers say we stole the show on, on numerous accounts, and uh, I'll, you know, pat myself on the back for that one. But. Um, I, I remember being told by them, um, I've known those guys almost as long as I've been in the business, you can't sound check while we're eating. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? What's, what's that even mean? They ate, but they ate during our sound check time, right? So we had to wait for them to finish eating before we could make any noise. <laughs> yeah. 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 All cool. It's all good. You didn't have yeah. the bandana on that fellow. It wasn't him, was it? Or no? Uh, Danny, it doesn't matter, I guess, who it was. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, listen, uh, I'll... I'll shut up too, because I, I have I have a story about said band too, but I won't I won't let the cat out of the bag. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, we've all got stories, right? And not yeah. everybody's a, an angel all the time, uh, right. unfortunately. Yes. Well, um, it's it's uh you know, it's just one of those things when you meet your hero, you hope your hero lives up to uh, what you think they are in your head. And yeah. uh, I'm, you know. I'm not going to lie, and I'm not kissing butt. I'm so thankful that you're such a nice person because I did definitely grow up listening to the headpins. And uh, if if you had got on here 
tearing my eyes out and just being nasty, it would have broke my little heart here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Normally, awesome. Dave's normally Dave's the ass kisser, but that's uh, that's from the heart right there. <laughs> oh, do I miss my cue? Shit. Okay. I've been, yeah. I've been drinking, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, awesome. So, I, I, who, who wants to drink alone? Um, ju but just to get your point about k Kiss, I just, not last year, but the year before, uh, was invited up to be the guest singer at a concert, uh, a festival that's happened for a few years, that Gene Simmons took over and then walked away from so it was called canifest and it turned into titans of rock and then it became another name and now it's not going to happen because of covid but um when jeans gene simmons band played there two years ago the organizer um had been asked by gene get somebody get up on stage and sing um i was made for loving you but they got to be in gene simmons makeup <clears throat> and i saw the organizer post that and i'm like oh heaven help whoever who, heaven help whatever fool does that and uh the day before they're to play my phone rings darby would you come to canifest you're only a couple hours away would you come and get up on stage and sing with gene i'm like are you kidding me seriously i gotta wear gene makeup he's like yeah i'm like what the hell? Okay, I'll I'll take it. I'll see if Gene remembers me. He actually was a jerk to me about a year and a half ago, and I publicly went I went public with him being a jerk to me, <laughs> jokingly. But I was interested to see if it got to him. <clears throat> anyway, so I that night I'm trying to learn the song. I'm trying to get the lyrics down. It's in a key I can sing in, and I'm like, what key can't you sing in? Stop it. Yeah, I can sing in the key of A. That that's so, or maybe G. Um, so I'm like, I'm not putting black face on and then having to spend the rest of the night wearing Gene Simmons makeup. And when you do that, it doesn't come off without a full shower. How do I? So I um I cut out the Gene Simmons mask out of gaff tape. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Put it on and and took it off and went. Okay, that kind of works. So. It's supposed to be a secret. Nobody's supposed to know it's me because I had not missed a canifest since it started. I, I'd been at every one. And uh, so it was a secret that I was coming to do this. I got there. They hid me in a trailer for like three hours. And I got my stage clothes on because Gene, Gene's band was going up on stage. But I wanted to see him before they went up on stage to see if he knew who I was. Not to mention that the band told me an hour earlier, oh, no, it's not in A. It's in D. Like, oh, Oh, <laughs> like what? I don't sing in D. Like, oh man. Anyway, so uh, panicking, uh, I'm dressed in my uh, sexy, sexiest outfit that I could put together. And I walk up to Gene as they're going up on stage. And I'm like, hey, Gene. And he looks at me and he says, oh, oh, uh, um, uh, um, Took, um, um, Brent Fitz yep. was his drummer. And, um, I had, sang a couple months earlier on the Took album on Don't It Make You Feel Like Dancing. So he pulls me aside. He's like, Darb, do you know the key's in D? I'm like, no, I didn't. The key is not in D. The key, <laughs> what? So he straightens me out there somewhat. <clears throat> and uh, so Gene's walking to the stage with his entourage. There's 30 people following him as well as Brent. And he, Brent stops. He says, Gene, this is Darby. Darby's going to get up and sing. And Gene stops and looks at me and he says, where it's the makeup. I didn't have the mask on yet because it was a joke, right? And I didn't want to. So I'm like, ah, uh, he says, you don't have the mask. You don't get up on stage and walks away with this 30 people following him, right? And I'm like going, oh, okay. So I'm like, Liz, who was there with me, we got to get back into the trailer and get the mask on. So we get in the trailer. It's 110 degrees. And it was just like, mm. it's like, no, it wouldn't stick on my face. I'm sweating, right? It, it, so I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. So I run down to the lady who's taking care of backstage. And Annette, the mask won't stay on. Jean doesn't want me on stage unless the mask's on. And she's like, my daughter might have eyelash glue. Perfect, let's see. So she runs out, she comes back. She has a bottle. So we glue the gaff tape onto my face, right? Um, 
he introduces me. I get up on stage, I walk right up to him and, I, and I'm like, look, and it's, here it is, gaff tape. And he's like, what? And he's laughing. So that's all good. I do the song, I leave the stage, I go to take it off and I'm ripping layers of skin. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Gene. Love ya. Anyway. Did, did, did you remember when you called him out? <laughs> you know what? I didn't go there, but another piece of information. If you ever watched Family Jewels, do you yeah. remember when Sophie got a dog? Vaguely, yes. Vaguely. What was the dog's name? Was it Derby? It was. Figure that out, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, so, I mean, obviously his wife being from Canada would have, would have been a – because I remember – oh, geez – it was back when much music used to be a, a music show as opposed to a reality TV show. And they were having the, the, the video awards and Pamela Anderson was going up with Kid Rock or she was going up with Kid Rock. And he made the comment, what's that band that used to listen? April what? April, and, and it was the big joke that this American guy didn't know who April Wine was. So you know darn well that Shannon Tweed knows Darby Mills. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I, as, far, as far as Gene goes and his criticisms, he was critiquing the artist that was on stage after him, which I thought was so funny because Gene, um, and I do respect the fact that he is the dictator's dictator, you know, mm -hmm. like that guy, uh, he has taken and run with it. Uh, so respect for that. Some of the things he says and does leave me questioning, but uh, so he's backstage. We're kind of just chilling a little bit, and he looks up <laughs> at, at Burton Cummings, and he says, you know, when's the guy going to lose the stash? He's had it all his <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm looking at a guy with hair that's come out of, I don't know what test tube, right? And I'm just, I, I laughed. I did, I just like, I just, I'm like, Gene. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what the hell? There's a, but, you know, a some people don't look in the mirror. There's a great thing on YouTube where him and Paul are doing this uh, interview. And Paul clearly has had enough of Gene for one day. So they're asking Paul a question. All he's doing is, you know, every every character or whatever Gene said, Paul's cutting up. Gene's like, will you stop that? And they cut it three or four times. And Paul's just getting the best of them. And it's absolutely hilarious. But the other funny one, too, if you've seen the Gene Simmons celebrity roast, Shannon Tweed lights him up with the first line. I don't know if you've seen it or not. I will go watch it. Yeah, her first line is like, just for the record, when Gene and I first started dating, I was the one with the big breasts. And that's just starts the whole thing, right? <laughs> Anyway, I digress. <laughs> yes. Don't we all? It's okay. Yeah. Have another drink. Yes, here we go. I mean, this is, how are you how are you doing for time, Darby? Like we're we could talk all night. You tell me what your time frame is like. Well, I don't know. I have a show. Okay. I'm joking. I have no shows. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have nothing. I have absolutely nothing to do. So if you want to keep going and you want to hear my silly stories, I'm I'm yours. 100 percent well you mentioned jewelry so you you you've got a you've got a, a jewelry business on the go i do yes yeah so how are you selling that you're doing it online like how, how's that and how'd you start that that's uh that's that's very interesting uh it's on derbymills.com it's on the website um okay. under phantom designs and um uh, once again, that was through necessity. Uh, my husband was home after the heart attack and he was in bed for, you know, recuperating for a month or so. So my job was pretty much just being at the bedside or waiting for a call. And uh, yeah, I just was like, I need to be doing something. I got to be in the house. What can I do? I, as a child, I was a rock collector and, and I pulled out my old black velvet chocolate box filled with rocks and went, yeah. What can I do with this? I got some uh, some beads and stuff too. I'll put something together. So I made a couple necklaces and and gave them away to my high school buddies who all seemed to congregate here 30 years ago in Vernon. And um, none of us, we all graduated together in Kamloops, but we all ended up here uh, in our older years. And um, 
they were quite complimentary and, and got one or two orders from people, excuse me, who saw them and said, can you make me one? And I'm like, well, okay. So I made seven or eight or 10 or however many, just four friends and whatever. And then I went, you know, people are saying they buy them. So I made a couple and just put it on the website as, and I'm six, six years in now and finding it, it's my yoga, it's my catharticism. It's, um, it's that, that was my ability to create when I couldn't write songs, when I couldn't play, when I couldn't do anything to keep my spirit um, sparking. Uh, it, it, it sparked, it, it gave me, um, if you're a creative soul, you need to be creating. That's all there is to it. And so that's where that came from. And I'm really grateful because I can still do it. It still, still scratches that itch for me and people are still buying them. So um, kudos. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because another another part of the conversation David had had I tell you about about your documentary. I made the comment. I'm still playing in a band. You know, I don't have any delusions of grandeur about making it anymore. But we're just a fun little band. We, you know, we're quite successful out here. But I said to Dave, if all I could do was go to my job every day and I didn't have that as something else, um. Yeah. I don't know that I'd want to get out of bed, not to sound brutal, but it's like, that's the kind of the release to get rid of the whole. Yeah. And we're very fortunate as musicians that we do have that, that, you know, we're, doesn't make us like everybody else. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and uh, how grateful are you that you went through the experience back in the day where pretty much anybody could make a living as right. a musician it's true i did i did you know in the in the 3 years if that that i spent in the bars i probably did more shows in that period than the likes of upcoming artists that are doing it now um, because they didn't get the training in the bars they didn't learn <laughs> They didn't live that life. I'm so grateful that I lived that life and lived through it because there are lots that didn't. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, searching to find that again, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. I, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. So the universe, thank you for bringing me into the picture at that time because I got to go through that and just how, how fabulous was the 70s 80s in the 90s uh, listen i want to ask you a question but first of all i, I want to take a break because quite honestly I'm, I'm in my 50s now and i have to have a piss so we're gonna <laughs>